stack of books. I got books too. Here's my here's my list, which I, I here's my. Can you stack. Um, use it to cover your face so I don't have to look at you while we talk? <laughs> Last time we talked about, what did we talk about? Well, mainly we just quoted The Office, I think, for a good portion of the time. That was that, that was like the first three hours or so. <laughs> that was the most interesting part, probably. And then we talked about <laughs> theology. Um, and today we're going to talk about literature, favorite pieces of literature. And there's a bunch of uh, construction happening right outside my window. So there'll probably be some beeping in the background here. But anyways... Um, You've got a stack of books. I've got a stack of books. We've put exactly zero planning into this. So <laughs> this is the most this is the most laid back and casual of these that I do, but I really enjoy them. What what could go wrong? Zero planning. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> so um, we'll probably end up talking about Calvin and Hobbes at some point too. I <laughs> I uh, I actually won the there was like a geography B when I was in like fourth grade and I won it because of Calvin and Hobbes because there was a question about Easter Island and no one knew what Easter Island was and to this day I don't know anything about Easter Island other than Calvin makes a snow version of Easter Island. That's that, that's what I was thinking if somebody makes a reference to it. Wow, yeah. there you that, go. Actually, that that is a really insightful comic strip, I think. But oh oh, it's 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 great literature as far as I'm concerned. Yeah yeah. So, yeah, but if we get advance toward the end of this, we should also talk about why we read and how you read when you're mentally tired and don't have a lot of mental space or time. Yeah, yeah. It might be good to try to weave that in in some way. And we should talk about uh, what we're writing, because I want people to know about stuff you have coming out and other fiction that you've written. And uh, we can talk about my apologetics book, too, because we've collaborated about that. So. Mm. You should yes. go first. You're you're more interesting than me. Um, give us, uh, take us through. I don't know. Give us a couple of your favorite pieces of literature. I'm wondering right. if you have any of the same ones because I see some C.S. Lewis stuff there. So shocking, right? That I have C.S. Lewis. <laughs> Here's my stack right here. I've got I've got poetry off screen. So if I run out, which won't happen, <laughs> I, I have something else to talk about. I think I'm going to go first to Gene Wolf. Nice. Gene Wolf, guys. Gavin, when you when you edit this, can you have awesome Lord of the Rings string music playing in the background as befits the Chariot great actor Gene Wolf? Um, I don't know anything about Gene Wolf except that you like him and and that I should read him. I, I I literally have no context for Gene Wolf other than I've heard you talk about him. I I'm gonna sign off right now, Jeff. I'm just done. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. Okay. <laughs> no, Gene Gene Wolf is he is a conservative Catholic science fiction and fantasy author. Hmm. Um, he has changed my life. I am a different person because of Gene Wolf. Interesting. Um, I'm a different man because of C.S. The, the only author for me I would put on the same category on the same level as C.S. Lewis is Gene Wolfe the only really? one and I can't tell who I like more who's influenced me more he died just last year okay. genuine believer you can you can tell from his writing he really believed it he is a Roman Catholic Christian and that comes through as well he actually fell in love with the Roman Catholic wanted to marry her and was reading G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis voluminously and in the process came to really believe Catholicism. So anyway, his magnum opus, Wolf goes, oh boy, Gab, I'm really going to try. Whenever I get talking about Wolf, I just, I, I like half Take an hour away. goes by and people are like backing away nervously. <laughs> Have, I, I, I feel like a crazy person when I talk about Gene Wolf because I just get, I, it, anyway, okay, I'm, I'm going to do my best here. There are periods okay. to Wolf. He's early Wolf in the 1970s is extremely complex in depth. He did the fifth head of Cerberus and Peace. Um, really interesting, but but tough. His magnum opus that came out in the early 80s is called The Book of the New Sun. Oh, and by the way, I'm just going to say spoiler warning for all these books. I will give mild spoilers for all these books. One of my definitions of great literature is something that can be read when you already know the plot and it's still enjoyable. Everything on my list. Is, so you will still enjoy the books, even if you know a little bit of what happens. But there are going to, some people like to go in cold. So there are some mild spoilers here for all Okay. Of us. I have two questions um, already. Go. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. If someone wants to read Gene Wolf, what's the first book they should read? And secondly, what kind of science fiction are we talking? 
Oh, okay, great question. I'm excuse, excuse we'll pause for station identification while I, while I get some more books. Um, the kind of science fiction, it's more, it's more kind of classic science fiction, like space opera type stuff, spaceships, aliens, other planets. It's completely different from what someone described the Book of the New Sun as a mixture of G.K. Chesterton and Buck Rogers. <laughs> Maybe that doesn't sound very attractive, but, but it's accurate in more than one way. Um, yeah, it, it feels like classic. Should I, should I pretend that I know who Buck Rogers is? I'm just going to smile knowingly. Ah, yes, Buck Rogers. It's it's like space, spaceships and lasers. It, he was like a TV character from the night from the 1920s or something. Oh, like right. Okay. So you you people will get more of a sense of of what kind of science fiction as we go along. I don't have the front cover for this book, but the Sorcerer's House is the place to start with Gene Wolfe, um, because it's just a good story. All of Gene Wolfe's books they're just interesting stories in terms of what's going on. But they're four-dimensional in different ways. One of the ways Wolf does this, he has unreliable narrators. Sorcerer's House is about a classic scholar with a twin brother. He's writing letters to his twin. He's been in jail. We don't know why. He, he's squatting in this abandoned house, and it's a sorcerer's house. And there's a werewolf and a Frankenstein guy who is actually hilarious. It's one of the funniest characters he's ever written. And he meets Musashi Miyamoto from ancient Japan. Lots of magical stuff happens. This is a place to start because there's always more going on in the story than Wolf uh, lets on. There's always a kind of slight of sleight of hand going on. And he'll sort of be tipping his card saying, this is what's really happening in the story. He does it more obvious. It's easier to pick up on the tricks in this book. So it's a good place to start Wolf. Okay. So I love Wolf because it's just great fantasy science fiction stories, but they're all four-dimensional and epistemologically really interesting. Okay. To wit, his magnum opus, The Book of the New Sun, far future, millions of years in the future on planet Earth, the sun is going out, it's starting to expand and turn red. You can see the stars during the full daytime. Uh, it's the first person narrative of a guy named Severian, and Earth has regressed to this medieval state where people don't even know what electricity is. I'm getting that crazy feeling again, Gavin. I'm going to keep this brief, <laughs> I promise. People don't even know what electricity is. Everything's sort of medieval. Huh. Different humanity has already gone to the stars and brought back different alien species and they mixed and mingled with stuff. So um, different animal species around and there are cacogens, that's their name, alien species who are quite horrifying. Earth is ruled by the autark, this all this autocratic figure. And Severian, who's a torturer, he's in the Guild of the Torturers, gets wrapped up in a plot to kill the Altar because he thinks that's going to restore humanity to their greatness. He winds up, spoiler, he winds up becoming the Altar himself. And it's the book of the new sun because humanity's sun is going out. And it ends, well, toward the end, it's the Altar Severian representing humanity is going to be judged by this higher race of angelic beings to see if earth gets a new sun or not. All kinds of Christian symbolism. It is, it is the most convincing scientific portrayal of a futuristic world I've ever read, hands down. It's fascinating to read. It, and it's just a great science fiction story. And Severian claims to have a flawless memory, but he contradicts himself. So your only inlet into this strange world is Severian, who's unreliable. That's fascinating to me. However, Wolf is never just subjectivism. You can figure out what's going on. He just doesn't tell you. So I find when I read Wolf, I get to the end of the story my first time, and I think I missed it, like there is no climax. What happened? What? And then I go through a second time and I think, oh, that connects to that, to that, and then that means that. And it's like, oh, that's what's going on. Oh. And it's always because he's a Christian, this wonderful, big, redemptive horizon. Mm -hmm. But you have, you have to read multiple times and pick up on the clues. And I love that because the struggle to interpret a Gene Wolfe novel is the same struggle I have to interpret my life. I don't know what everything means in my 45 years so far, but as I continue to go through my life, I'm going to say, oh, that connects to that and that and that and that, oh, God, was at work the whole time with right. a new son. That, that's what I love about Wolf. It's a superb story and, and just philosophically complex and interesting. And then, okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go hold ahead, on. go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, I already have other questions. Number one, did you ever yes. meet him in real life? 
No, but I wrote him a letter. And I was going to ask that was my next question. Did you ever write him? I've got his I've got his letter up on my shelf. I keep it and I read it. I have my little shrine to Gene Wolfe. I have his picture up on my wall. So. Oh, cool. So uh, I, I can sense your enthusiasm for this. It, it, it does make me want to read it. It's... Can, can you, Gav? Can you? <laughs> and by the way, for people watching this, they need to understand that uh, this is sort of us shamelessly nerding out. So we don't hold back. So if people, uh, it, it, if they're hoping- I feel, I, feel, I feel a little bit ashamed right now. <laughs> um, all right. So I had other questions, but I don't want to cut you off. If, it, 30 seconds. My personal favorite is The Wizard Knight. If you want a great fantasy story with knights, damsels in distress, dragons, magic swords, elves, monsters, dragons, did I mention dragons? I, it's all it's all there and it's great and if you want the really interesting complexity it's all there it's about a 12 year old kid it's taken to a fantasy world he, he gets this elf and lover and suddenly he's he's a 25 year old he's a massive powerful man and he's a knight but on the inside he's just a 12 year old so he doesn't understand everything that's going on he only describes as much as he understands and as you read you can pick up connect the dots in a way the narrator can't and it, it just, the book, just, I'm just in tears. I'm just a wreck every time I finish it. The, the ending is so beautiful and moving and poignant and tender. Hmm. There, there's an undertone. Wolf, Gene Wolf fought in the Korean War. He hmm. came back deeply scarred, I think. Hmm. And his wife, Rosemary, really, really ministered to him and helped him. Early on in his books, there will be at times horrific violence. It's never portrayed in a tragic way, but I think there's a trauma that's coming out there. And the undercurrent of Wolf's books, his major books, is pain. Hmm. And the, the narrator here is in pain. And a lot of the people around him are in deep pain. Um, and boy, the ending is just, it just wrecks me. It's so beautiful. The, the conceit in this novel is all the Norse gods are real and the giants of winter and old night are on the horizon. They're going to conquer everything. He meets Loki at one point. There are the, the, the Norse god Loki. There are, in the, the, the fantasy world, there's seven levels of reality. Everyone is at the, the middle fourth level. You have a higher level with Odin and Thor, a higher level above that with characters with names like Michael and Gabriel, and then the most high God above, God above them all. It's a world where worship should go up and it goes down. Human beings have gotten into worshiping the elves who live beneath them. And the time is out of joint. Abel's got to set the world right. And it's about being a heroic noble knight which is what I want to be for my family. And every time I read this, I feel I've got steel put in my spine interesting. to read. And the it's un- super interesting philosophically. The unreliable narrator. <laughs> the unreliable narrator thing is interesting. I hadn't realized that about him. And it also seems like his books are somewhat, one can be different from another. It also seems like there's, there, it doesn't seem like there's a nihilism behind it. It seems like there's there's something rich and and good that comes through. Every Gene Wolfe book has a bigger redemptive horizon. He's keenly, he, in, at one point he says, we are all unreliable narrators. We can't really trust our memories. We don't understand. But there's this bigger redemptive horizon coming through. But you, you've got to read it more than once to piece it together. Mm-hmm. I have friends who love to read deeply literary people who don't like Gene Wolfe. So he's not for everyone. I've never gotten past him. I'm sorry I talked so much, Gav. No, it's no, no, friend. this is good. I love it. Okay, I'll go next. Um, mine is going to be not as good as yours. <laughs> Come on. I'm going to about to pull out Calvin and Hobbes here. Um, well, I, I guess I got to go with the major one, the obvious one, and that is um, Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. Now, I know you've probably got that in your stack, so so we can talk about this together. Um, okay. I, what I love about it is for people who haven't read this, you know, most people have read some C.S. Lewis. But a lot of people read Narnia and his kind of uh, devotional slash theological works. Some of his works like are hard to categorize exactly. But so, you know, people have read Screwtape Letters and Mere Christianity and things like that. I What I love most, I love everything C.S. Lewis does. I just got uh, volume two of his letters. And so we'll talk more about habits of reading in a little bit. And what I've been doing is in the evening and I sit in the backyard with my kids while they play, I just pull that out and just kind of leaf through it. But um, I love C.S. Lewis's fiction. There's something about it I just can't. In fact, I'm going to talk about two books. The other one is I'll talk about is That Hideous Strength, which, yep, probably there. (laughs) So real briefly, so if people have never read this, maybe people watching this have 
they've read C.S. Lewis, but they've never read those books. I don't know how to, and this maybe will be a theme of our conversation, is why is literature so powerful? Why does it affect you so deeply? Why does it convey things that nonfiction can't fully convey? I don't know. But even more so than other forms of, of narrative, like movies, I find literature, I don't know. I mean, there's times I've gotten into a good book and it's like, it's such a source of happiness and refuge just to, you know, go through the book. So till we have faces, I, I'm not even going to go through everything about what the book is, except just to say the theme of redemption in this book. There's this character named Orwell. She's filled with hatred and enmity for the gods because she lives in a kind of an ancient pagan culture. She becomes a queen. She becomes great. So I want one of my dreams is to write an article about this book called Taking Off the Veil. It's all about identity and finding identity in your work because she wears a veil. She builds this whole identity out of her productivity, her accomplishments as queen. You know, she's like terribly treated by her father when he's the king. And then she mm -hmm. kind of fills his shoes and does even better than he did. But mm -hmm. all of her accomplishments don't fill the wounds in her life. But the very like one fifth of the book, I won't give any spoilers except to say, mm -hmm. um, it, it's the kind of book you have to read, kind of like you were saying with Gene Wolfe, you have to read it through multiple times. For this one, mm -hmm. I had to persevere through parts. It's not yeah. as much of a page turner. No. Then, you, then you get to the end. And for me, my experience was, I don't know how to uh, describe it, but just the redemption that she, the way she completely does a 180 and she comes to see I'm the problem. It's not uh, the gods that are the problem. And just the, the way he describes redemption, the way he describes when, sorry, mild spoiler, when she does get to heaven and, and is reconciled mm -hmm. with, it's just, um, you know, you can, you can try to describe the idea of conviction of sin and repentance but to see it dramatized in this way where your whole life long, because you identify with her, you identify with her in her hatred and enmity for the gods. And then you see, oh, you know, it's a 180 sheet. And something about that is so beautiful. And then this is the third, and I'll let you talk about these two, but we've talked about this book so much already. This is, this may be my favorite book of all time. I have it on audio and I just, I never stop listening to it, you know? Oh. Oh. Something about the quality and the atmosphere of it. Um, it's the third in the space trilogy. And again, I could go on and on. The characters are hilarious. The bad guys are so funny. He, he, <laughs> he, he, he depicts good and evil in such creative ways. Oh. Something about the yeah. atmosphere of the book. I don't even know what it is or how to articulate. Yeah. It just kind of draws me in. But yeah, yeah. I, I want to hear your thoughts on those two as well. Oh boy, so so many thoughts. So to I till we have faces is not one of his most popular books. It's more sort of agonized. And people who like other Lewis don't sometimes don't like this. I understand why. It's one of my favorites. In addition to what you said, Gab, there's a cultural aspect. If you read, like I'm in old te old testament studies, try to know as much about the ancient world as I can. Ideas of purity and ritual and symbolism and sacrifice, boy, they're so well represented here. It, it's a beautiful exposition of two kinds of love one selfish and one selfless. And there's the kind of epistemological oral thinks she is right and she's been wronged the entire time. And as you read, you kind of sympathize with her. You see why she would think that. And at the end, she does the complete 180. She says, I'm the problem. The, okay, mild spoilers. When she, the book is a charge against the first sentence. I'm old now and have not much to fear from the gods. I can accuse them openly because I'm old. What are they going to take from me? <laughs> and she gets to read her charge before the gods and it's different from how she remembers and the answer she i'm not going to ruin it the answer she gets oh my i'm getting chills thinking about it right now it is so dramatic mm -hmm. um the the yeah i mean in terms of 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 why i mean i don't know i, I i'm an academic i mean it's hard for me to come home at the end of the day and read because that's what i'm doing at the office but mm -hmm. there's something about great art that will be highly particular and universal at the same time and that's deeply nourishing that I feel brought home to my, I, 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 at the, I, I'm able to read him when I'm mentally tired, when it's a good book like C.S. Lewis, because I am both divested of myself. I get to lose myself and be absorbed in something else. And I'm brought home to myself it, it, at the same time. So, and, and what I love about that hideous strength is it, it gives me a kind of connection with reality, like really good poetry. I've got Gerard Manley Hopkins here, my favorite poet. 
he, he has a God, glory be, he has a poem, glory be to God for dappled things. And, and he has one line there, uh, rose mole all in stipple on trout that swim. Rose mole all in stipple on trout that swim. When I read that for the first line, I could see the trout in my mind's eye. It was beautiful, vivid animal. Good reading, it, it, it makes reality real. <laughs> and I feel like I can connect with God's world around me and it makes me feel more like a human being. What's so uncanny and beautiful about that hideous strength is you get angelic, spiritual, heavenly reality refracted down into utterly believable 1950s England. Yeah. <laughs> so it's both, it's both cosmic in scope and massive and dramatic and interesting and utterly, there's a granularity to the book I feel like all the people in the book I could meet, all the places, the things they do, they eat together, the places they are, the names of the streets, it's all intensely real. Yeah. And I just, I find that's edifying. It's kind of therapeutic when I've been at work all day. I fe feel more like a human being. That, right. That's what's beautiful about the Space Trilogy is you get the angel, he imagines angels as being responsible for different aspects of created life. Mm -hmm. And the first... Out of the silent planet, it's Mars, it's war, it's man manly virtue and perilandra, it's love. But here it's on Earth. And you still get, you get the spiritual and the invisible and the metaphysical enfleshed in the most convincing sort of concrete situations. And it's just so great. Yeah. There, there's so much going on that I don't fully understand with Lewis's medieval cosmology and the angels and all their different personalities and the way that flavors each book. Um, and I've often had the thought, you know how Michael Ward wrote that fascinating book on Narnia, really seemingly truly uncovering a secret about how Lewis kind of yeah. wrote those books based upon that. And I've often wondered, is there, are there other secrets in Lewis's writings that could be discovered like that? I will yeah. say one other thing about that hideous strength and what I love about this book is there's these two main characters and Mark and Jane, yeah. even their names, you know, all the names have significance in this book. Right? Oh, their the names are great. Yeah. Oh, and we got to talk about the character Wither. He's one of the bad guys. <laughs> so the bad guys at this place called the NICE are yeah. all so creatively depicted. And so one of them, Wither, which his name is perfect for him, he basically goes on and on and on talking, but never really says anything. And just the way that Lewis depicts that is so funny at times. Um, and then there's these other characters. Another one is named Frost, which is perfect for him. He's yep. uh, utterly cold, you know. He, he, he's a bright, brittle, hard, metallic man. Yes, exactly. Whereas Wither yep. is this kind of vague, shadowy ghost of a person. And, and, yep. he, and Lewis talks about how, like, over time, you know, committing your life to evil sort of wears away at your humanity. And it's, yep. it's actually a really powerful uh, portrait of what um, kind of the process of damnation, I think, is how he would have thought of that yeah. kind of yeah. where you're headed. But what I love about it is Mark. So Mark and Jane are these like typically modern people. Yeah. And just to be brief on it, and I've written more about this, but the basic idea is each of them has their defenses broken down. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so there's a kind of conversion they go through, but it's so different. In fact, they're the opposite. So this is a married couple. Yeah. Um, Mark, his great fear is the whole inner circle idea yeah. being excluded. Yeah. Yeah. So he has to go through this, his own kind of suffering to kind of, and it's this very particular journey that kind of breaks down his defenses against God. Jane um, is, has pride <clears throat> and um, Jane, Jane wants to belong to herself. She, yes. she represents Lewis's desire not to be messed with. He says in his autobiography, he just, he said, the world can be unfair and cruel. Just leave me alone and let me do my own thing. And that's, it's not a slander against women. It represents something very deep within Lewis. Because right. part of Jane's breakdown is submitting in marriage to Mark. Exactly. So thank you. So they have these different uh, problems that need to be dealt with. Yeah. And so they're story of being broken down is different and so opposite in fact jane ex her breakdowns happen through joy and and yeah. experiencing glory so anyway there's a lot more to say about that but it's just interesting oh. to think about conversion and the mm. way our defense mechanisms against god get broken down and how that will yeah. look different yeah. from one human being to another yeah yeah yeah
Yeah. And in addition, it's, it's the Tower of Babel story and man's worship of technology set in a very believable 20th century setting. Right. I, there, there's, there's, yeah, there, there's so much about, the, it's, it's edifying. Every time I read it, I try to forget it as soon as I can so I can read it again. Yeah. It's edifying on so many levels. The, the, des- the chapter titled The Descent of the Gods were the different angelic powers that in Lewis's Christian cosmology sort, sort of represent and look after different aspects of created life, like war and love and fatherhood. So Mars and Jupiter and so on. Oh, Gav, my yeah, screen I'm, just went blank. Are you still I'm, there? I'm back. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, anyway, it's one of my favorite chapters. Can I just read briefly the chapter describing the descent of Saturn? With That is to say time. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. So, stir the fire, Deniston, for any sake. That's a cold night, said McPhee. Must be cold outside, said Dimble. All thought of that, of stiff grass, hen roosts, dark places in the middle of woods, graves. Then of the sun's dying, the earth gripped, suffocated in airless cold. The black sky lit only with stars, and then not even stars. The heat death death of the universe, utter and final blackness of non-entity, from which nature knows no return. Can even omnipotence bring back where do the years go and why? Man would never understand it. Perhaps there was nothing to be understood. Saturn, whose name was Lurga, stood in a blue room. His spirit lay heavy on the house and even on the whole earth. What One more sentence. Matched against the lead-like burden of his antiquity, the other gods themselves perhaps felt young and ephemeral. A mountain of centuries. Anyway, I could keep reading. I, I, I love that because Lewis has a category for decay, ruin, Hebel, and Ecclesiastes, and, and the incomprehensibility of the world. He, he has room for that in his cosmology, which leads me to H.P. Lovecraft, which is my next one. And, and, and I'm so grateful to Lewis for that, because Lewis knows what Hold Lovecraft on, can is. I read a, I was going to read a passage, too, from the same. Go. Then Go. I'll kick it back Go. to you. I actually have two, but I'll choose my favorite one, which is, uh, mm. well, let me read from Till We Have Faces. Do both. Great Do pass- both. It's your channel. Come on, man. Splurge. We told people, we warned people, shameless nerding out. There's no no holding back. Okay, so this first one. Gavin's was, subscriptions just go. Out down after <laughs> yeah, my subscription. Oh, yeah, exactly. The, we're going to plummet. This is the end of my YouTube career. <laughs> it's all my fault. <clears throat> no, this is, it's just fun talking about this. But yeah, so there's this passage at the very end where Mark is starting to realize basically what a bore he's been his whole life and how wow. interesting other people are. And just the literary skill of Lewis. Um, he, so he's just like, you know, and we've all had moments like this where you look back over your life and you realize, oh, and you see yourself in fresh eyes. Yes. So um, now he thought that for all his lifelong eagerness to reach an inner circle, he had chosen the wrong circle. Jane was where he belonged. He was going to be admitted only out of kindness because Jane had been fool enough to marry him. He did not resent it, but he felt shy. He saw himself as this new circle must see him, as one more little vulgarian, (laughs) just like the steels and the cossers, dull, inconspicuous, frightened, calculating, cold. He wondered vaguely why he was like that. How did other people, people like Deniston or Dimble, find it so easy to saunter through the world with all their muscles relaxed and a careless eye roving the horizon, bubbling over with fancy and humor, sensitive to beauty, not continually on their guard and not needing to be. What was the secret of that fine, easy laughter which he could not by any efforts imitate? Everything about them was different. They could not even fling themselves into chairs without suggesting by their, by the very posture of their limbs, a certain lordliness, a leonine indolence. That is that, that's, Ju- that's Jupiter right there. That's the Jupiter. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. That, yeah, uh, leonine is in the adjective of the word lion, a leonine, leonine indolence. There was elbow room in their lives as there had never been in his. They were hearts. He was only a spade. And he keeps going. And just the, the, the literary quality of him coming to see himself through others' eyes <laughs> and feeling really humbled. It's like, I actually think we'll probably go through a lot of experiences like that continually through our lives where we come to see... Oh, that's how I come across to others. <laughs> Which, oh. 
very humbling, but just, but I just love that passage for the literary quality. Um, yeah. Of, of oh, how... oh. And, and, and there's that sort of, you're, you're, I'm, I, we are taken out of ourselves as we read and listen, and we're brought home to ourselves at the same time. We recognize ourselves. Yes. Yeah. There's so much like I could quote for, I have so many favorite passages. Another one is where Frost and Wither are meeting. Uh, and um, <laughs> it's like a demonic type scene. It's really freaky. But yeah, let me read one short. <laughs> They, they hug each other at the end of it and just start laughing. Oh, uh, it, it, it's as creepy. That's another thing. I actually think literature can be more frightening and horrific than movies. Horror, yeah. there's a limit. There's a cap at how scary you can get. I mean, it can be bad. It can be grisly and gross. Yeah. But yeah. but literature has an ability to just work at a deeper level. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Did, did you have a second quote? From yeah, real quick. Uh, sorry to take so long. Here's This is from Till We Have Faces right after she's given her complaint to the gods. And the gods say, oh, are you answered? Yes. And she yes. said, yes. Yes. Chapter ends, start of the next chapter. The complaint was the answer. To have heard myself making it was to be answered. Again, it's like seeing yourself for the first time. Oh. Lightly men talk of saying what they mean. Often when he was teaching me to write in Greek, the fox would say, child, to say the very thing you really mean, the whole of it, nothing more or less or other than what you really mean, that's the whole art and joy of words. A glib saying, when the time comes to you at which you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years, which you have all that time, idiot-like, been saying over and over, you'll not talk about the joy of words. I saw well why the gods do not speak to us openly, nor let us answer. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should they hear the babble that we think we mean? How can they meet us face to face till we have faces? Wow. Gives a sense of the quality of her self-understanding that she breaks into. Oh. oh, it's powerful. It's powerful. When Oral is having that vision of Psyche going through different testings, at one point she says she went further on. She went ever onward, further and further into death. Mm. Have you have you read Lewis's introduction to George MacDonald? Long about ten ago. pages. It, it's one of the most beautiful things I ever read. He he talks about how what he what he what drew him in MacDonald was the holiness of the book and also good death, spiritual death, death that liberates you know and uh yeah at one point psyche has to go get a cup and fill it with water that that is death and and, and drink from it mm -hmm. or she's lost yeah 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 and there is joy at the end of that book there is oh, joy. like Incredible like joy. oh i i quote from that when i try to talk about theophanies in the old testament i quote from um yeah the only joy the only terror was coming i was nothing before it i was no mm -hmm. one Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I was pierced through and through. I was being unmade with the joy of it. I was pierced through and through with the arrows of it. <clears throat> I was, yeah, I was nothing. I was no one. Uh, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. It blew me and, away and, when the first time I read that book. My congregation is very patient with me in using the <laughs> Tolkien and Lewis illustrations, but I don't know anything else quite like it. I don't know how else to communicate certain things, you know? People can complain about Lewis and Tolkien getting quoted all the time, but if you want to point out like somebody who does it better that's fine yeah <laughs> you, you, you know what a line i love from till we have faces is when the god when oral tricks psyche and the god makes speaks and says psyche now goes into exile and oral says there is no mistaking it it was a god's voice even in its sternness it was golden mm. and that one sentence like yeah i i know what that voice sounds like even though i've never heard it it's perfect yeah yeah it's so good okay your turn so continuing on the theme of Saturn, H.P. Lovecraft was a very depressed and not very nice atheist from the 1920s and the 1930s. Mm. Uh, not a happy man. Lewis was a, a healthily minded man. There's a leonine indolence and joy, elbow room in his life. Lovecraft, not so much. Mm. Not a very coherent atheist. There's something about his writing I can't get away from. His, his the whole thing in Lovecraft, it's, it's Saturn. It's it's cosmic insignificance. And Lovecraft is grappling with the fact that the entire planet could blip out of existence right now and the universe would not care. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, oh boy, I, I'm going to ask you to say something as I look up a short poem. Where is that? It's Nemesis. What he puts it at the front. Let's see if I can remember it. I've seen the Black Universe. Um, oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. I've seen the Black Un. Okay, I, I'm. You know, okay, Gaff, you go do one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to you and look up real quick on the internet so I can read it because it just perfectly encapsulates Lovecraft and it's bugging me. I'm nerding out. Yeah, yeah, no, go for it. You tell me the next book while I look this up. Well, how I'm, about can I just talk about your beard? That's going to take too long, <laughs> and it will be very shameful. So, excuse me. You you talk about your next one. All right. Um, I don't know if I can do a next one. Well, I can do a next one real quick. I'll do two two lightning rounds because otherwise we're going to be here forever. One is I read the book to to kill. These are simple, simpler, less. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. To kill a mockingbird. I read it in eighth grade. I didn't really get it then. I reread it. I I I've just made efforts to try to read more fiction, more literature over the years. So I reread right. it in 2015, and I just found it actually a very powerful. I, I interpret the great theme of this book as the unmaking of prejudice. And wow. of course, there's the great quote from Atticus Finch, I think about all the time, whether it be I'm talking with Eastern Orthodox friends or Catholic friends, and I'm trying to not do what we so often do, which is caricature at someone who's different. Yeah. Atticus yeah, Finch yeah. talks about seeing the world through someone else's eyes. But I actually yeah. came to think, I think the whole story is about that. I think it's all about, it's not just that one quote. I think that's a theme in the book. And just the, the main character has a point, not to give a spoiler, but she's literally standing on the porch of someone she's been afraid of her entire life someone who's represented wow. fear and uh you know this is a scary character and then she's looking out from his porch on her block and her house she sees her house from his front porch and she just i can't remember uh i should have again no preparation here i should have looked up the passage but it's just it's sure. basically just talking about the power of the unmaking of prejudice when you can actually, when the person you've been afraid of your whole life, you finally understand and you oh. see the world through their eyes. And I never approach disagreement in the same way after reading this book. It because of the, great. of the idea of you've got to try to sympathize. You've got to try to inhabit the concerns of your opponent if you wow. want to have a meaningful dialogue with them. Or you, well, you can do what most human beings do, and we always do, is just caricature them <laughs> or just well, kind of slightly caricature them. But if you really yeah. want to have, if we actually want to make progress in disagreement, I think we have to take that, see the world through their eyes approach. Wow. That's powerful, Gavin, and more relevant than ever today. Yeah. yeah. I, I found, it's just four lines. I found the poem Lovecraft wrote. I, I, he says, I've seen the dark universe yawning where the black planets roll without aim where they roll in their horror unheeded without knowledge or luster or name. Mm. And that's all of Lovecraft in, in four lines, basically. Cosmic insignificance, the horror, li literature is scarier than movies. The horror in vampire, with vampires, I think it's impurity, actually. It's contagion, contagion. With zombies, it's mortality, because that's what we're gonna be eventually. In, in, in Lovecraft, it's we don't matter. We do not matter. And human beings cannot face that truth without it sort of shattering mm. our view of the world and our sense of ourselves. He wrote actually some great science fiction stories, one of them about a, a, an expedition to the Antarctic where they found the they find the remnants of this alien civilization. They can see etched on the walls, human beings were created as a kind of court jester. Mm. And it, it, it dethrones human beings from being the center of the universe that were just a, an inessential accident. Um, Lovecraft requires patience as a writer. He once said that the great desideratum in fiction is not plot, it's mood and atmosphere. And it can, he can tend to overwrite things because he's trying to lay on the atmosphere. But his stories have that particular quality of a kind of nightmare. I haven't been able to get away from him. I think, I think he gets what Ecclesiastes is talking about. Hmm. He has none of the happy, you know, life is a gift of God, so enjoy it aspect of Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. He's only Saturn and never the joy of Jupiter, hmm. never the royal joy and generosity that Jupiter has. And yet it's true to life in a way. Um, and, and there is, I, I don't know, it feels real to me. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel like this is an, one of the, so 
why do we read literature and why is this powerful? Lewis talks about in his introduction to George MacDonald that some symbols, the symbol and the thing symbolized are pretty easy to tell. Mm -hmm. The ring symbolizes power, or power is corrupting influence, something like that. Some symbols, you have the symbol and the thing that's symbolizing is really hard to put into words. Mm. Like Narnia, what does Narnia represent? It's not heaven because it's corruptible and people can, die. What, what does it represent? And I can't quite say, but don't you feel like you've, you've been to Narnia? Don't you feel like you've been there? Lovecraft kind of does the same way. It's this deep symbolism that's hard to put into words and that I think is true to life. It's very dark and dismal. He's not a happy man. And yet Saturn is a part of human existence, by, to use Lewis's terms. So I like him. If people want to start, he, Lovecraft has a short story, Nyar Lothotep. He, he has a way of coming up with goofy names like that. It's very short, you can read it in five minutes. At one point, the narrator screams, he's not afraid. And every time I read it, when the narrator is screaming, he's not afraid, I'm not afraid. That's when it, that's when it gets me. Fascinating. What you said about atmosphere and mood being more significant than plot in some ways. It for Lovecraft. I actually don't agree with that, but that was Lovecraft's aim. Right. Well, just triggered a thought because I actually found over the last five years or so, I find that I watch movies for the mood and atmosphere more than for the plot. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I've always kind of been curious about why do I do that? But I've been at a point in my life where I'd rather rewatch an old movie that has nostalgic value. I'll watch certain movies over and over and over again. Um, and, I, and that's true for literature as well. Sometimes it's just the atmosphere that draws me in. Um, oh. I, I agree. I do the same. I, I don't know what it is, Gab. I, yeah, there are movies I've lost track of the amount of times I've seen them. Maybe that could be a, a, a new uh, video for your YouTube channel. If you have any subscribers left after this. <laughs> if people are watching this and they're not bored yet, give us a like because, I mean, <laughs> if we should, I, actually, I should give a prize for people if they're still watching the video at this point. No, I actually think people will find this really interesting, but okay, I'm going to do a lightning round. Go for it. Co Go context for it. by Carl Sagan. And I'm not gonna say, oh, sure. I'm not gonna say anything except this would just be a spoiler. Basically, I'll just say this. Yeah. I, I am in this mindset where I'm trying, I'm engaging, this is when I was in, we moved to Chicago for a year to work on the doctrine of creation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm trying to understand a secular kind of scientistic worldview sympathetically. Yeah. I'm trying to do Atticus Finch's thing to like a, a, a hardcore atheistic scientist type world view. Mm. So all those people, like Carl Sagan is like a patron saint for, for that mentality. Yeah. yeah. So I read this book thinking, because I've seen the movie, um, thinking, well, this, this, you know, it might be weird to read a non, to read a fiction book to try to, but I think fiction, again, sometimes that conveys things uniquely. And I'll simply say, I'm going to make a video and tell something like why, uh, you know, something like what, how I was surprised by, or how Carl Sagan surprised me or something like that. Yeah. In yeah. so many ways, he steps out of that atheistic, scientistic worldview. And the book wow. is filled with a kind of supernatural aura that I did wow. not anticipate. And it's just interesting. And he raises the question, well, you know, why? What is that? What, what? So That's amazing. I'll, I'll get into the specifics of that in another video. That's amazing. It's amazing. A lightning round. Stephen King, The Dark Tower series. There's, I, okay, please understand, I'm not telling anyone to stop reading your Bible and read Stephen King. There's a lot of swearing and killing in this book, okay? <laughs> it's an apocalyptic Western. Roland, the, the gunslinger, is chasing the man in black. He goes into this town. Everything is decrepit and awful and gross. There's a huge cold sore on one guy's uh, uh, lip. And a guy, a man in the town has died and they've laid him out in the town bar and they put two slugs on his eyes because that's what you do when you're a character in this book. And the guy in the honky tonk piano is playing Hey Jude. The last, it's, it's five longish chapters. The last chapter, it becomes cosmic again. It's some of the most gripping, right, imaginative, fantastical writing I've ever read in my life. Interesting. I, I, I like it. Cool. Okay, I'll do another lightning round. Yeah. Jurassic Park. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, come on. Really? Yeah. I, 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 this one of your favorites? Well, uh, you could have been reading Gene Wolf this whole time. My <laughs> I know that it's kind of like, uh, you know, I read it in seventh grade or eighth grade or something like that. And it's nostalgic. 
Uh, it's a great story. And the other thing about it is it's making an interesting point because if you read the little preface, or it's not a, called a preface, it's called a, maybe it's just the introduction. He's basically saying the dinosaurs are a metaphor for commercialized genetic engineering, which you, oh, could, inter- extend, oh, okay. you could extend that to say technology gone amok, you know? Wow. And this book was written in, I think it's, I think it was written in 90, 1990. So it's old. This wow. is like what, 30 years old now. But uh, anyway, just the idea that that actually is a really cool idea for a metaphor about kind of undisciplined use of technology. You can, you have all the power in the world, you can create something, but then the thing you create destroys you. Interesting. It actually is an interesting metaphor for like, say, this. (laughs) Yeah. Incredible power in my hands with this phone, but it can destroy me. It can make me stressed, anxious. It it can literally kill me. Um, And uh, so plus... Plus, sometimes I just like a fun, just simple book. Sure. <laughs> so sure. I read that. I, re- I actually reread the Jurassic Park book. Part of it is I'm constantly reading things that are taxing and take energy. So sure. Nice yeah, me nice too. Something really, really simple. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Neil Gaiman's Coraline. Hmm. This is the most perfect fantasy. It's not my favorite. It's the most perfectly constructed fantasy novel I've ever read. Begins with a quote from G.K. Chesterton, fairy tales are more true than true, not because they talk about dragons, but because they tell us dragons can be defeated. Mm. It's perfectly acceptable for a 10 or 11 year old to read. It's one of the scariest things I've ever read. I have never looked at buttons the same way again. (laughs) And if that's not a good uh, plug, I should put a video or a description link to these books in the video description. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if people want to. How many, more, how many more do you, Gav? I want to ask you about your apologetics book. I don't. I don't yeah. want to let this go on too long. How many more do you have? I have two more, and I could do lightning rounds with them, or we could even just end. What do you want to do? Do do two lightning rounds, and I'm going to do one sentence for my last three ones, just really quickly. Okay. Lord of the Rings. Enough said. Uh, yeah. Enough <laughs> uh, said. Brothers K. Dostoevsky. Brothers Karamazov was intimidated by it. Did it by audio book cannot describe it except to say i'll say more during our apologetics when i talk about the apologetics book it's just uh, here's what i'll say here's what i'll say and i wrote a blog post about it people can read um the character yvonne who represents atheism gives an incredibly heart-rending tear your heart out because it's so sad speech about the problem of evil that is unanswered throughout the whole book the main character alyosha is I think named after Dostoevsky's son who died when he was three, named Alyosha. I think Dostoevsky is, so the question is, well, is Ivan's perspective Dostoevsky's perspective? Is that what he thinks? And I think no, because the events of the plot undermine Ivan's perspective. That's my, I might be wrong, but that's my take. I think, I think Dostoevsky is showing sometimes there's no good answer to the problem of evil but it's still not true. I don't oh. know if I'm saying that just right or it still doesn't oh. disprove God. I, I, I've read that book twice. I don't like it as much as Notes from Underground. Maybe we could talk about that further at some point. That's very interesting. Yeah. Hemingway, Old Man and the Sea. Hemingway's prose is viscerally pleasurable to me. I don't admire his philosophy as much. His philosophy was a man can be broken, but not defeated. I don't really, eh, but the prose is amazing. Mm. Flannery O'Connor's wise blood. Man don't need no car to get justification, Gavin. The the dense symbolism, like the message of the book is you can't run from God, but holy cow, does she in flesh, does she incarnate that message? There's a policeman who comes along who pushes the main character's car off the road. It's terrifying. Mm. Terrifying. And there's at one point when Hazel Moats finally gives up. And he's going to do this act of penance to repent. He gets a bucket of lye and he goes home and his landlady says, what are you going to do with that? He just says, blind myself and goes upstairs. Like it's, it's vivid and hallucinogenic and horrifying and has one of the most moving endings I've ever, I've ever read. It's amazing. And Shusaku, Shusaku Endo silence about Jesuit missionaries, Japan in the 15th century, Mm. the problem of evil again. At one point, a missionary says to God, I resented your silence, Lord. And it ends with the missionary saying, from now on, my life will speak for you. It's, I love Japan. 
Shusako had a kind of wonky Christology, but it is a powerful novel. Is that is that related to the the movie that came yes. out? Okay. Yes, and the movie is good. I I can't imagine how the movie could have been done better. But the ending of the book is far more powerful and a far more profound expression of grace than the movie quite gets. Yeah, the movie. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it's more redemptive a little bit than the movie. M much more so. Much more so. Hmm. Gavin, do your last lightning one, and then and then I want to ask you about your apologetics book. That was it. But I want to. Oh, okay. So we can talk about that. You... But also, go ahead. Okay, so this is not scripted. I read a a pretty close to final draft book on apologetics. I have my favorite bookshelf right over here, my, all my favorite books. You, Gavin, and you, Gavin didn't ask me to say this. Your apologetics book was so bad. I'm going to buy every copy of Existence and burn them because it, <laughs> it will destroy the foundations of Western civilization. No, I'm kidding. Gavin, your, your apologetics book was so good and so moving and interesting and so edifyingly written. It is going on my favorite bookshelf, my, my favorite book's bookshelf next to C.S. Lewis. It's not, you were, Gavin, you're, you're able to think and feel and appeal to people, to converse, to engage with people in so endearing and warm a way. This is unscripted, guys. Gavin didn't know I was going to say this. It's, it's intellectually satisfying and, and, and relationally satisfying. In this multidimensional way, you're making an appeal. And I found it so moving and interesting. And I just wanted, I just wanted to keep on reading it. I, it is... I mean, I don't know, Gavin, you're one of my favorite theologians anyway. So I, 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 people are saying, oh, Eric's saying nice things about Gavin. I heard that before. But it is, it is a significant book. Yeah, I'm so glad it's coming out. It's one of those books I will read multiple times just because it's just good to read. It's good to read like good food is, is good to eat. Maybe that's a dumb analogy. I don't know. But that's how I felt reading it. It's superb. That's what I have to say about the book. Do you want to say anything? It wasn't quite enough. Could you say? Uh, <laughs> just crank it up a notch. I'm going to name my next child after this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, it, what it, What do you want to say about this book, Gav? Oh, uh, just uh, I'll just put I'll just excerpt what you just said and make a, repeated YouTube videos of you saying that. Um, <laughs> thank you. That's very On kind. I, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. I just, you know, I, I had written several books in the realm of historical theology, which is kind of my formal area of training, but I just went, I, mean, I just remember being at Bart's books, this bookstore here in Ojai, uh, and kind of, I was a little down. I was like, I don't know what to do next. Um, and I saw, and I've of course always been interested in apologetics, but I I'm there and I'm seeing these cheap editions of Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, their main three books. Sure. I bought them and sure. I thought, maybe this is the next thing. Started reading, started getting into it. And I just found that this book came from my heart more um, in a way it's hard to articulate. There's just arguments I got into that I didn't think would be uh, possible to make, like an argument for God from math, an argument for God from music, an argument for God from love. Yeah. Totally. I don't like apologetics. That's the weird thing. I mean, usually yeah. I, I have yeah. I have hesitations about how it's often done, but I just found, I thought, wow, actually there can be a certain kind of appeal that is made from these things. So anyway, that it comes out in October uh, from Baker Academic. It's called Why God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't. Thanks for saying all those things. But let's talk about your stuff. Everyone should buy it. It's genuinely great. Now, okay. Yeah, because I love you and we're friends, I'm gonna be really mean. And now that I said nice things about your book, can you say nice things about my book, which I don't <laughs> think you've read? Am I right? All right, let me stop, let me stop. Okay, look, for like I tell people when I tell them to read Gene Wolfe, if you don't like it, it's okay, it's okay. If you don't like a book, you should just read what you enjoy and don't read it because you feel like you have to. And I mean that. And and I, I, I think it's okay if I say the Lord has helped me disentangle my ego from my own writing. When people say they don't like it, it's genuinely, or if they haven't read it, um, because, you know, theological zombie apocalypses, not a real big market for that, you know? But, 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 let, I, me, but let me say, so hold, yeah, okay, so hold up dead pedals. And I want to say, I, I think people, um, I, I find your writing, and this is why I love just doing this. I just find it absolutely fascinating. It's almost just sort of like, uh, I, I could just throw out any topic, you know, I could say, well, I, I, you know, like we've done angels, 
go. <laughs> and I just thought I learned so much from talking with you. I absolutely love it. And your writing is so good. Dead Petals. Yes, I have read it. Uh, oh, you'd read it? Yeah. Uh, I, I, it was a while back um, when, it, when, it, when I first got it and I loved it. And I think there's a kind of, there is a kind of C.S. Lewis quality to it where it's what I like. Okay, several things I like. One thing I like is it's subtle. A lot of Christ, a lot of fiction written with self-conscious awareness of, you know, redemption or just a Christian worldview is not subtle. It's like Christian movies, you know, they can kind of be pretty ham-fisted. Yeah. Your book is subtle. And it's also just... Uh, it's just interesting. I mean, it starts off with a bang. It's just a fun, well, it's easy to read. I gave it to a student in my youth group um, who, she was a sophomore in high school and, oh, sorry, my camera will come back on in a second. My, she was a sophomore in high school. She devoured it and absolutely loved it. So I would say younger, you know, teenagers can find it fascinating. And I also love it. It, it feels like you're going into our culture's narratives. So why a zombie novel? Well, Think how many zombie movies and books and things there are. Why is our culture, and if I understand you, you're asking this question, why is our culture so interested in that? And is there any way that uh, the story of the gospel can be told through that medium? And, and the whole idea of zombies is actually a really interesting idea to think about spiritual deadness, you know? So, and, and the, the idea that sometimes it's not the zombies that are the greatest threat, it's the, act, it's the human beings. Mm. Um, I don't want to give spoiler alert, alerts about the content of the book other than just to say I, I loved it and I think people will, I think more people should read it. I think people find it absolutely fascinating and I want you to share about your upcoming writing and other fiction that you've got so we can learn about that and I'll put a, a description to um, Dead Petals in the video description. I'm not going to do descriptions for all these books but I'll do for that <laughs> that one. And, sure. and then share with us about other stuff you've got that's coming down the pipeline. Well, okay, it's all, it's all very sort of, I mean, it's written, but it's sort of in, in cohate. I'm, 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 something, there's a, a, a avenue for publishing that I'm trying to help uh, get started, but it hasn't, it's still very, very sort of planning. So this isn't going to be out anytime soon. Um, uh, but I, I, I wrote my, so I'm fascinated by the way the Old Testament hijacks genres from the ancient Middle East. I'm trying to do the same thing. Paul says we're dead in our sins and trespasses. That's pretty interesting for a culture obsessed with zombies. Mm -hmm. um, I like H.P. Lovecraft a lot. Um, and, and I think that there's a significant opportunity to, in a parable-like way, talk about insignificance and significance through this genre. So I've written my own H.P. Lovecraft novel. Um, and I, I, I wrote a, a novella. What's, what's about, the title? Or can you tell uh, us? I am, I am the doorway. Mm. Yeah. When, when does it, it when, how, how could people learn more about it? You can't. <laughs> it's okay. totally not out yet. In fact, okay. yeah, if possible, perhaps at some point, once it's actually in print and our website is up and, and the machinery is going, maybe, you, you know, we, we could uh, talk again and we could Definitely. give some links whatnot to that if that would be okay definitely um but yeah it, it it's the, the manuscript is uh next to my desk um so i'm trying tr i'm just trying i this is too much at the for an hour-long conversation i'm trying to uh help start an avenue by which it can be published and i've got another i'll have another book it's there's a novella about the long descendants of a group of astronauts to a different planet and the being they think is a god that they worship, but who isn't really, with some other short stories um, about you know ghosts and monsters and whatnot and whatnot. So, cool. I'm sure people will be fascinated to uh, when it does come out. And yes, let's talk more. And also your YouTube channel. What uh, you have two YouTube channels. Tell us what they are. Uh, both are super boring. One <laughs> is just for Hebrew. It's just for people who have a year of Hebrew on the belt under their belt who want to keep reading i haven't been keeping up on that one i haven't forgotten it it's not dead just people weren't watching the video so i just thought okay people are too busy right now um we're just going through isaiah 53 verse by verse and i'm just saying this is how you know this is a hit verb this is how you translate this and so on mm -hmm. um the other was just for imaginative creative stuff guess what gaff guess how many subscribers it has guess how many i have eight subscribers i'm actually going to kill that channel soon um, and we're just going to have um, uh, a separate channel 
me, me and my friends that all of our artistic creative stuff goes in there. Oh, cool. So okay. If you want to see, I mean, I, I have a reading of an H.P. Lovecraft story on there. I have poetry I've written and so on. If you want to go, go look for Eric Ortland, um, because it's, it, it, it'll be over soon. So. Yeah. Okay. I'll put that description or I'll put the link in the video description as well. Um, what else was I going to ask you? There was something else, but it slipped my mind. I love talking with you. I find you, I find I, I, these conversations are so fun. So thank you. Um, and yeah, there was something else. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. How, any advice on how to, how to go about it? Cause you mentioned at the beginning, you know, it's like we, it's hard to create space for reading literature, especially with yeah. our phones yeah. and our constant distraction. Yeah. How do you actually get it go about like carving out the time and energy? Yeah, so I, I, I find it's best to see it is reading for me. Some people, for some people, it's going to be woodworking or fishing or something. Mm -hmm. That's fine. And, and, and the, the other thing is I give my time, I give myself time to watch baseball clips on YouTube or play a video game. I give myself time to do that. That's okay. I'm not reading 24 hours a day. But I also put all devices away and out of the room. And I tell myself, if you're just too mentally tired to read right now, that's okay. But we're going to give it 10 or 15 minutes and see if the gears engage. And I just, sometimes, some stuff I read because it's important. I just force myself through it. But I tell myself, if you don't like it, don't worry about it. We'll put it down. We'll go on to the next thing. The rule for reading is just whim. And if you want to read Michael Crichton, if you want to read Twilight, read Twilight. That's fine. Um, I mean, you should be morally discerning about stuff obviously but in terms of the quality of what you read if you enjoy brothers karamazov read brothers karamazov if you enjoy it it means it's doing something good for you right and then i find i read for about 45 minutes and my brain just it's like the gears stop engaging and i'm mentally tired and it's time to go watch baseball clips on youtube then yeah i love it that that emphasis upon just what you enjoy i think that's the greatest piece of advice about productivity is if you enjoy what you're doing, it doesn't feel like work. And so as much as you can channel your energies toward what your passions are. It's, it's helpful for me to ask Eric, what do you want to do right now? Do I really wanna be on Twitter? Is that really what I wanna be doing? Right. What, would really, what would I really enjoy doing right now? And it takes me a minute then to say, I wanna take a walk. I wanna play Neo. I wanna go talk to my daughter. I, I, I want to take the dog for a walk or whatever. And, and I don't know, it's a lot healthier. Yeah. All right. Hey, I love you. Your stuff is amazing. I admire you. and <laughs> Your stuff is amazing. <laughs> so let's talk again when, when that book comes out and maybe we should just talk. Okay, so we've done theology and literature. I'm trying to think of if there's something else we could talk about. Mov movies and music. Ah, okay. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Because I think we're more different in our tastes in there. You'll have some some Japanese films, I'm sure, that I will not have heard of. <laughs> and I'm pretty boring when it comes to movies, I, but I don't I don't really like non-mainstream steam stuff. So I'll be actually really curious about yours. I'm oh happy. wow, okay. Um, I love the okay. non-mainstream stuff. So yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you.